I took a little special trip on Janus and Jambres there and uh, the subsequent narrative law and rule and uh, looked at some of that and hopefully that was uh, beneficial to you and so forth. But we're down now to verse number 10 and uh, we'll be in this verse this most of the, uh, for today and the next week we'll, we'll move on a little bit better, I hope. But verse number 10 is a, is, a, is a wonderful verse. It's a powerful verse. It is a verse that um, gets uh, some attention, but it also gets um, some misunderstanding about it as well. And I'm Okay. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, affliction, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You'll notice how the section starts, But thou, Timothy, Again, Paul talking to Timothy, but thou, Timothy, but the contrast now to what we've just been talking about in verse, well, really verse 5, <laughs> since verse 1, <laughs> okay, but really it's in verse number 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt mind reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. And again, Timothy, don't be like the Janus and Jambres crowd. And we went back and we looked how in Exodus 7, where Moses and Aaron go in before Pharaoh, and he cat, Aaron puts his rod down. That's okay. Pharaoh calls Janus and Jambres, the magicians, and by sorcery and enchantments, they outdo Moses two to one. But Aaron's rod does what? Eats them up, and that's their folly, completely destroyed at the end of the day. Don't but and, and what the point here is is when you're out doing when you're in ministry and you're doing the work of the ministry, it's gonna look like you're being outdone two to one. You know, when the mega churches were going strong, they're not anymore. I, I dad made a mention about it in, at the Bible conference about they're down to about 40 of them left in the country when there was like 400 of them. And so we were, I was talking to him about it, and he said it's because they have nothing to stand on. It's all gimmicks. It's all a facade. And when it's very interesting when times get tough and the mega churches were struggling. I know personally here because I talked to a couple in uh, the big church in Mesa there on uh, Brown and Lindsay. And I talked to the guys there, and when they began to struggle, they really began to struggle because they had to let staff go. You know, they asked their director of music, the head guy of music. I talked to him because <laughs> I, I actually I was looking for the senior pastor. I want to talk to the big guy making the decisions. And they asked him to step down. They asked him to stay on and do the music with no salary, no compensation. And you know what he said? No. No, thank you. So when the so that's a facade. He's doing it for the what? For the paycheck, for the filthy lucre, say. See? So when the tough get when the times get tough, real quickly what begins to happen? Think now the, by the way, the senior pastor, he didn't take a reduction either. <laughs> but they can't if he goes away, they go away because he's the personality. So the thing of it is, is in the, what Paul's getting in, Timothy, but thou, Timothy, don't be like that crowd. Make a decision to be something different. If you look down at verse 13, but evil men, then verse 14, but continue thou in these things. See, Timothy, this is what they're going to do. They're going to be men of corrupt minds. They're going to be reprobate concerning the truth. They're going to do that. Don't you do that. Evil men are going to wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, verse 13. But you, Timothy, you need to continue here. 
this is what the church history is going to look like, Timothy. I'm leaving. Here's, here's what the last days, the perilous times, those dangerous times that are coming. Here's what it's going to look like. And Timothy, you can't be duped by the show. When Moses, when Aaron laid his rod down in front of Pharaoh, that was the miracle. The magicians, Jonas and Jambres, the, Jan, Jonas, the Jonas brothers. Yeah, just stupid stuff go through the mind, you know? I, I, I watched a movie last night and ended up being rather later than I thought it was going to be. And anyway, the guy in there didn't know who Beyonce was and didn't, he lives up on top of a hill, you know? And it's like, okay. Anyway, that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Tim, Timothy, here's these guys. Don't be like these guys. Janice and Jambres, that was not a miracle. That was an enchantment. That was a hands quicker than the eye thing. They were magicians. Don't be a part of that crowd. Timothy, don't be like them. Don't be different. Now watch verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, my charity, my patience, my persecution, my affliction. Now I stuck the word my in there because Paul is appealing to Timothy's knowledge about how Paul conducted himself. Because that's, the, that's going to be the issue. Paul is our pattern. If, if you come back to chapter 1 here in, in, uh, of First uh, Timothy, I'm sorry. First Timothy 1 and verse 16. First Timothy 1, 16. We, we know these verses. We've spent the last year and a half in them. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first, who's the first guy? Paul is. Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a what? A pattern. He says, I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. I'm the due time testifier. Paul, Timothy, you've been with me. He's been with Paul since early Acts, so uh, his early Acts ministry. Timothy, you've been there. You know me. It's very interesting. Come, come over to Philippians. Come back to Philippians. <clears throat> Look at verse 17 of chapter 3. I'm sorry. Philippians 3.17. It's one nice thing, not having the overhead for the first hour. I can go where I want to go. <laughs> And then I look down and go, oh, I didn't go there. Look at Philippians 3, verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. Isn't that interesting? Paul, and I know what everybody does, ensample means example. But no, it doesn't. It's a different word. An example doesn't have an N and an S in it. And the E-N, N, sample. You have us, well, what's going on inside of us? For, if you look at verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the, what? The enemies of the cross of Christ. That comes from inside. That's the end sample. See, that comes from down deep in, 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 in you. But Paul says, do what? Mark, mark people who are walking like we're walking. Verse 9 of chapter 4, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. So when, when you come back here to 310, when Paul tells Timothy, You've no, you have fully known, he, he tells the guys there in Acts, he goes, I haven't left, I've given you everything. I haven't left anything out from you guys. I've fully given you all of my doctrine, all of the information. When he says there, you have fully known my doctrine, we're, we're just going to look at each of these because, and, and it's really hard to just pick one verse to talk about it, but that's what I tried to do, okay? Because when, if you don't want to be like the reprobate men, then you're going to have to follow the pattern. So Paul says, you need to know First, my doctrine. You need to know, Timothy, you need to know what I preach and teach. And by the way, Timothy knew that. He has fully known it, okay? 
We get our doctrine from who? From the Apostle Paul. If we're not, if we're getting our information from somewhere other than Paul, it's not for you and I today. Okay? We just had the Bible conference about the world's most dangerous doctrine. What is it? Being scriptural but not dispensational. Plug in whatever the issue is, we got to work it down. Come back to second to chapter 1 here of 2 Timothy. Chapter 1 verse 6. Paul when he says you fully known my doctrine and then he's going to say manner of life and and the rest of that list. The rest of the list, the manner of life, the patience, the charity, the long suffering, the purpose, the faith, that's the him practicing my doctrine. That's him practicing what he preached. And when we go through it, I hope you you see that. Because when Paul preached something, he then went and lived it. He didn't just preach it to fill the room up and to have the the, the show and to go. He actually went out and lived it. 2 Timothy 1 here, verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, talking to Timothy, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us, and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose, and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Wherefore, I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul says, Timothy, you fully known my doctrine, the sound doctrine, the good stuff, the doctrine that was given to me by the Lord Jesus Christ is now given to you, you've known it. Verse 11, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle. Of what? Well, according to his own purpose, verse 9, in grace, he's made known by the manifest of the appearing of our Savior, verse 10. All of that is through, the end of verse 10, the gospel. So the information, come over to chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 1. So the information today came from the Apostle Paul. You go over to Galatians 1, you look there at verse 11 and 12, and he says, hey, I received this from the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't get it from no man. I know, I know where I got my information from. You look at Ephesians 3, I mean, the verses you can just flow with. You go to Ephesians 3, we'll get there in a little bit here on another topic. And he says, hey, you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which has given me to you word. Then he says, hey, over there, by the way, the apostles and prophets are, all this is being known to them by who? By the Spirit. The Lord talks to Paul directly. Paul then turns and teaches everybody, and the Spirit works with that teaching word. 1 Timothy 1, verse 13, I'm sorry, verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they, what? Teach no other doctrine. Well, what doctrine would that be? Well, look at the end of verse 10. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So you've got a doctrinal thing. Now, I skip verses 4 to 11, 4 to 10 there, because what's happening there? People are teaching other doctrine. Verse 4, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Hey, they're over here, got the, they got the facade going but they're not godly edifying. The end of the commandment is charity. People want charity today. They have have an odd understanding of what the word charity is in Scripture. They want charity, but how do I get charity? The end of the godly edification process is charity. What produces charity is the godly edification process, not emotions, but who you are in Christ and learning that and renewing that mind and keep moving forward. But what are these guys doing? Well, what did they become in verse 7? Desiring to be teachers of the what? Of the law. 
understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. That's 2 Peter 3.16. They've wrestled the Scriptures to their own destruction. They think if I give, if I give you a law, that will kill sin and it will stop sin in your life. That is, the law is designed to bring about the knowledge of sin. The law just gives the sin the strength. It acknowledges it. What is The only way you're going to stop sin in your life, I, by the way, I have Titus 2.12 for February's Bible conference, so I've been stu- you know, starting to think about it and read about it. And the thing is, is you know what stops sin in your life? The grace of God does. Not a law. All a law does is make you feel good. It doesn't deal with it. If it did, Hebrews says, if the blood of bulls and goats took away their sin it would have been done, but it didn't. Look at verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained it, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. By the way, be very careful with verse number 12. People misread that verse. He enabled, especially that enablement, he enabled me. And what they usually say is he enabled him, putting him into the ministry because he was faithful. How was Paul faithful before his justification on the road to Damascus? He was a faithful killer and persecutor of the church of God, wasn't he? So God rewarded him for doing that? No, he didn't reward him for doing that. He was a blasphemer and and persecutor. So when you read that, the enablement comes because Paul is faithful to the word given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. This doesn't go back to his beginnings, it goes back to his life in time, since the road to Damascus. The enablement comes from the faithful reliance on the truth of God's Word to him. So when he says to Timothy, go back there to 2 Timothy 3, by the way, in, in, first, in chapter 1 there, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, he put him in this ministry, Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. How be it in me first, he's going to show this pattern of long suffering. See, Paul's like, Timothy, you've, you've heard about that since day one, all along. Then he says, my manner of life. Now we're going to move to him practicing what he preached because he's preaching in... in Manner of life. Come over to Philippians 1. When you talk about manner of life, he's, he, he's talking about Paul, the way that Paul lived. Timothy saw it. You, you ever, when we were growing up in our household, we had to have good manners at the table. That meant no elbows on the table. That means chewing with your mouth shut. Don't talk with your mouth full of food. Finish your food, then talk, you know, okay? Good manners. Table, corrupt uh, communication, uh, uh, evil communication corrupts good manners, okay? So, you, manner, how you live, how do you conduct yourself? By the way, having good manners just makes other people comfortable around you, you know? It really does. And I know today, in today's thing, I, t- I told Linda, we ought to start a business about etiquette and chivalry, because it's gone, you know. It, it, it's amazing to me how young men don't, um, I see it every day on the school bus, they push and shove to get on the bus, and I'm like, what are you doing, dude? We got, you're on here for a half hour, man. What are you in a hurry for, you know? But it's like, okay, so now I begin to instruct them about ladies first. She's no lady. She isn't. Do you understand what a lady is? She doesn't know either, so now we have an instruction time, okay? (laughs) And then they look at it and go, would you just, you're a weird bus driver. I got that this week. I'm like, okay, yeah. 
Well, you know, you say good morning to them. You say, have a great day, you know. And they're like, you say that every morning. Why? I said, well, because I'd like you to have a good day. And if I don't say you that, I'm going to tell you what I really am thinking, and that's, gonna not, that's not going to be really good, you heathen, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but the thing is, is manners, how you live life, the way you conduct yourself, you know, it, it's, it, they, it's just it's not there today. Timothy saw how Paul lived life. And how Paul lived life was exactly the same way in what he preached and what he taught. Look at Philippians 1, look at, down at verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Now, all that has to do with that stuff back up above, about he, he's in prison and guys are preaching against him and so forth and everything. But notice verse 21, because we use this verse, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But that's not how you ought to be looking at that verse. What did he just say in verse 20? Whether by life or death, what's going to happen in my body? Christ is going to be magnified. For to me, Paul says, to me, the focus of my life is who? Christ. To die is gain. That's, that's fine. I, but right now in time, it's more needful for me to be here in the flesh for you. He's going to tell him here in a minute. But for to me, the way that I've thought about, the way I'm going to conduct my life is that Christ is going to be magnified in every circumstance. So the focus in Paul's life was Christ be magnified. It didn't matter what was going on. In the, and here he's in bonds and stocks and bonds. He's in prison. He's in jail. He's under some persecution. Guys are out preaching against him. And you know what he says? That's okay. Christ is magnified. You, you see that? So where did that come from? It came from the doctrine. He's out here preaching. Not I, but Christ. Our life in Christ. The hope of glory, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There it is. Boom. It's, it's, it, by the way, the book of Philippians, every chapter is the, Christ is the center of our life. Chapter 1, it's, He is our life. Chapter 2, He's our mind. Chapter 3, He's our goal. He's our fixation. He's, our, he's everything. And in chapter 4, He's our strength. Everything in, the cha- in this book is about Him and His. I want to know Him, He'll say in chapter 3. I want to know Him more and more. See, Timothy saw that. Then he says, Timothy, you fully known my doctrine, in my manner of life, how I live life, but you also fully known my purpose. Now come over to Ephesians 3, because the issue of purpose, <clears throat> again, <laughs> it goes right in line with everything that Paul's been preaching and teaching. And in chapter 3, verse 7, 8, and 9, here is Paul's purpose statement of ministry, of his life, of everything that he's doing. But he does it with a purpose. Notice verse 7, wherefore I was made a minister, and that has to do with making known the revelation of the mystery. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that Here's his purpose. I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's point one. Point number one in his purpose is that I'm going to be out there preaching the gospel to anyone and everyone that would ever hear me or listen to me. I'm going to be preaching them the unsearchable riches of Christ. What's the will of God? 
who would, he would have all men be what? Saved. There it is. I've been talking to you since Romans 1.1 about gospel and the justification, salvation, all three phases of it. My purpose, number one, is be out there preaching that God, preaching the gospel of the grace of God, the unsearchable riches of Christ. And, verse 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now. The second part is to make all men see what is this fellowship of the mystery, to see what this fellowship that we have one with another in a local assembly, the fellowship that we have one with another, but also with the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We, we have this fellowship, and we're going to make all men see. We're going to take this fellowship, and we're going to broadcast it out there publicly and put it on public display, and we're going to make it known to everyone. That Boy, what a purpose statement. I had a guy ask me one time, what's the purpose statement of your, your, the local church? And I went, what's a purpose statement, dude? You know, we just preach and teach and Bible study. He's like, well, you got to. So I sat down and figured out a purpose statement, you know, and looked around online, tried to figure out some things. I found a couple, and you know, they were good. So we have a purpose statement. You know what our purpose statement is? See, you don't probably don't even know because I don't talk about it because what is it? It's everything we've been doing. It's to see lost people get saved and saved people get edified. How's that? That's just what he just said. See, now there's a couple other points in that, but that's the simplified, that's the Rick version, okay? But see, the thing is, is Paul says, you've known my purpose, Timothy. Timothy's with him. This is Ephesus. This is where Timothy's at now in 2 Timothy. Come over to Acts 20, or back to Acts 20. Acts 20. He, he's at Ephesus here in Acts 20. Look at verse 23. Acts 20, 23, and 24. You see, when he says, my purpose, Timothy, you've fully known it. <coughs> I've been out here since day one pushing. We're going to see some people get saved, and we're going to see them get, come to the, some understanding. Remind me of Acts 14, just a second, okay? <laughs> Look at Acts 20, 23. Save the Holy Ghost, witness in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me, but none of these things, so the bonds and the afflictions, move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish, now watch, my course with joy and the ministry, Acts 20, 24, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. In Galatians 1 over there, he says, I was separated from my mother's womb to do what? To reveal him, the son. Paul understood his purpose. He understood his course. By the way, he did it with joy. He's in bonds and affliction. Still did it with joy. Why? For to me to live is Christ. The reliance upon the doctrine that I've been preaching in every aspect of life. You come over to Acts 14. See, I reminded you. Acts 14. You see, Paul understood what life was all about, folks. We get up in the morning, and boy, was it foggy yesterday. Boy, that was so pretty. You know? Went outside, and I was bundled up thinking it was cold. I, I, by the time I got out the door and turned around, I was sweating like, a, like it was 180 out or 15 again. And I was like, man, we, the humid, the humid, the moist. It was so pretty. It was just, I was like, wow, it was quiet, you know. Now, tomorrow, it needs to be sunny, okay. <laughs> Today is sunny, so we go back to the sun. But the, it was, but you sit out back and drink a cup of coffee, and we have ducks that have moved in. They usually move in our cul-de-sac in the wintertime. And uh, they weren't, they haven't been around, but one year they were in the, they liked our swimming pool. I didn't like them liking my swimming pool, but they liked my swimming pool, okay? And a couple cats have been introduced into the neighborhood again, so they're, they're not in the swimming pool anymore. But, uh, you know, you sit back and you just, oh, so pretty. And then you see the pictures up north with the snow and the 
cabin and everything. And it's like, oh, isn't that so sweet? Isn't that so nice? So calm. We go hunting. I went hunting with Jeff and them, and, and you sit up in the, in the woods, and it is, boy, you're talking about so quiet. Wow, just you can hear the squirrels play. Peaceful. That ain't what life's about. Sorry. It's nice to have, don't get me wrong. But Paul understood what life was about. What's life about? Seeing people get saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. It's ministry. It's work. Acts 14, Paul lays out the the process. Verse 21, And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Now, this is where he's going to mention these guys in 3.11 in 2 Timothy. So we're at the beginning of Paul's uh, ministry, his apostolic journeys and stuff here. But what does he do? They go into those strategic cities. And, he see, and he, what is he doing? Preaching the gospel, isn't he? Then verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith that, with mu- uh, that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. What's he doing with those saved people? Edifying them, building them up. Then verse 23, and when they had ordained them elders in every church, he did, now what did he do? He just established a local assembly, didn't he? so that the believers knew how to come, where to come and gather together and have some fellowship one with another and work some of the doctrine out amongst themselves. You see, that's purpose right there. That's a wonderful purpose. What are we going to do? Hey, we're going to get saved. We're going to see some people get saved. We're going to come to knowledge. We're going to get them in church. Why? Because church is a wonderful place. Well, yes, it is, but church isn't. It's not the building. It's the people. It's the fellowship. It's the coming together. That's why I always say I think we ought to be meeting every day of the week. You know, I, I know realistically it can't be done unless we're all retired, which that means somebody's winning the Powerball and paying out for everybody, okay? <laughs> but see, the thing is, is that's when we come together, what's happening here? You, you, you get a little reprieve from what's going on around you in the world. My purpose Paul, come back to 2 Timothy 3, verse 10. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, don't be like those guys. You know where you got the, you know, you've seen me. You, your pattern, your apostle in the doctrine, and you've seen me practicing what I've been preaching to you. My manner of life, my purpose. Then he says, faith, my faith. And th- this one usually causes a lot of people heart a trouble. And, and I, quite honestly, I don't understand why. Because when you talk about faith, look over at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And, uh, and on your way, stop in 1 Timothy 1. You know, go to, go, to, go to 2 Timothy 1 verse 12. Let's go there first. When you talk about faith, Paul, it's interesting, Paul will talk about the grace that was given me He's talking about the message of grace given to Paul, okay, the, 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 the information. When he talks about faith here, look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. For, for the which cause I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Now watch Paul's my faith. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's Paul, when he says, you've fully known my faith, that's what he's talking about. See, Paul is talking about taking the dare of faith and trusting the Word of God to be true. That's what he's talking about. Come over to 2 Thessalonians. Hold on to 1 Timothy 1 there. 2 Thessalonians 1, look at verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. He'll tell the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 1, he calls it, verse 3, without ceasing your work of faith. When you talk about work of faith, what you're saying is first, 2 Timothy 1.12. I know whom I have believed. 
and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We're, see, we're talking about trusting the Word of God, that it works when you believe it. And we know what Paul looks at Timothy, and he says, Timothy, you fully known that, man, I trust that Word at every turn, regardless of what's going on in society, the circumstances of life. The Word of God is what I'm going to go by. That's what he's talking about, faith. I'm going to trust the Word, that it is what the work is all about. And I'm going to do that. You see, Paul had confidence in God's Word. So when he did something and went and did and worked, it wasn't motivated by him doing it. It was motivated by the Word working in him. That's 1 Thessalonians 2.13. Effectually worketh in you that believe. I know whom I have believed. You know what? When he, when he says, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You know what Paul's saying there? I know that God's not going to let his word fail or fall. And I know it will work. Romans 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. And everybody, oh, see, he, was not, he wasn't hiding over in the corner. That's not what he's talking about when he says ashamed. He's talking about, I know the, gospel, I know the word's going to work. And it works in you that believe. Come over to Philippians chapter 1. That strikes me when I think about that. Hopefully you too. Today, raising children is... A little different than when some of us raise children. By the way, I say that as if I'm, I'm older than dirt. That's because I was up at Sears. You know, Sears is going out of business. So I was up there and uh, buying stuff at what it really cost, not at the inflated value, okay? And I, and I bought a workbench, and I was dragging it. I didn't have a two-wheeler. They didn't have anything. The guy's like, I don't even have a helper to help you. I said, that's okay. It's in a box. I'll just drag it out. It's going to sit outside anyway. So I get it to the door. Well, this young man comes up and goes, sir, can I help you? And I'm like, oh, did it just happen? <laughs> and I said, sure. I, he goes, well, where are we going? I said, the Chevy right there because I parked up close because I knew I was going to be dragged. And I was like, doggone. I got home. I said, I am out and officially an old man because <laughs> I had to have a younger man help me. <laughs> But it took, it, would, it took two of us. It should have been three of us doing it, me supervising. But uh, anyway, Philippians 1. See, when, when we talk about raising kids, I see children every day in the, on the job. The modern ways of raising children don't work. You know how I know? I see them every day. <laughs> when the Word of God says raise your kids this way, don't worry about what... Society says, raise them how? How the book says to raise them. See, that's what he's doing. I don't, it doesn't matter what we're doing out here. What's the book say? To, let's go that way. Philippians 1, and notice verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, isn't that interesting how he says this? That he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. You know, if you raise your children according to how the Word of God says, not how people do, and you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is the day of Jesus Christ there, and he says, you did all that wrong, what would you say? Well, I did what the verses were telling me to do. So then I guess I was wrong. But I was obeying what? The verses. Follow that? That's what he's talking about. My faith. I'm confident. I know in whom I believe. I'm persuaded. I'm confident that everything he's doing in his book, in his word, it'll last all the way out there through eternity. Paul preached that. 
and he then went and lived it. Then he says, long-suffering. Come over to 2 Corinthians 12. Then he says, long-suffering and charity. And I'm going to do this in one verse, these two in one. Long-suffering and charity. Because I, because of some of the conversations we've had here in the past about charity and love and so forth, I've, I've, tr- and, and I've tried to find a verse that knocks a lot of that down and simplifies it, okay? And in the issue of long-suffering and charity, Paul says, Timothy, you've known my charity, you know my long-suffering and my charity. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 15, nails both of these words in one verse. And it's very interesting that everybody, nobody knows this verse, or when they use this verse, they abuse it. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Do you see long-suffering and charity in there? I hope you do. Because the first part of that verse is long-suffering. The issue there of, I will very, very, what? Gladly spend and be spent for you. I will, t- I will allow you, I will be long-suffering with you. And I'm going to do it gladly, with a glad heart. And I'm going to, be, I'm going to go spend everything I have for you and on you. And then I'm going to allow you to take advantage of me. That's the, and be spent for you. That's, I'm going to let you take advantage of me for the ministry's sake. And just let you do with me what you need to, what needs to be done. Not a problem. So that's, that's long suffering. Then he says, though, the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. And there's charity. The more abundantly that I love you, the more that I value and esteem you and think about you the way God thinks about you. That's charity. And what you need, the less I'm going to be loved because you're not thinking that way, Corinthians. There's the charity. It, it's not emotion. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a divine viewpoint, <laughs> as it was once said. So Paul looks at Timothy and he says, Timothy, you know my long suffering. You know how I was willing to spend for others and, uh, and to do it with, and to stay with it all the way to the end. You're in 2 Corinthians, look back at chapter 11. At, this, at the end of this very long list of his sufferings, started in verse 22. But I want you to go down to verse 28. Besides those things that are without, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, 28, that which cometh upon me daily, the care, it doesn't say of the church. It says of all the church. Now, I have you guys. He had everybody. You think, you know, don't call Rick, he's too busy. No, you better call Rick, (laughs) okay? But what happens is is I I get a phone call, hey, you know, I know you're busy. Yeah, but it's okay. (laughs) I can, if I know there's an issue, we carve the time out and fix the issue. But see, the thing is, is notice, Paul had all of the church. Now, we don't do that. The church belongs to the, the church is the Lord's body. It's his business. He takes care of all of it. We just take care of ourselves here. There's the long suffering. Timothy, you saw that. You know how I was willing to, to be spent and spend for other people all the way to the end, no matter what. And then to have the viewpoint that God had for them of I love you and I care for you and have that issue of charity. So when you come back to chapter 3, verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. You've known what I've taught, and now you've seen me go live what I taught. My manner of life, my purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, 
patience. Now, patience, uh, come back there to Philippians 1. Patience is an interesting, uh, that's peace under pressure, it was once said. But Paul's patience here really is more than just having peace under the pressure. It's really that issue of the ability to hang in and not quit and, and have the proper viewpoint about what's going on, allowing the doctrine to influence all the way down into the dark days. Philippians 1, look at verse 12. But I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ, so he's in jail. He's the Philippian jailer. He's in jail, okay? He's actually here, verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. Don't ever, don't let people change that to place. I heard a guy one time say that was a misspelled word. Instead, of, it should be pl- take out the A. No, we're in Acts 27 and 28 territory here. The palace and in all other places. Now there's the places, okay? But see, the thing is, is Paul's situation, he's not crying, bring, get me a new lawyer, get me out of here. He has a completely different viewpoint about this. Now this is stuff is happening for the furtherance of the gospel. Now watch the situation. And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Well, you know how that gets. Well, they got the ringleader, so now they're not looking at us anymore, so now we can go over here and do, you know. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. Look at what's going on. Some are preaching for the right reasons, and others are preaching trying to heap on, you know, they're filing a brief with the court (laughs) type of thing of support of the prosecution. Now watch verse 18. What then? Notwithstanding every way, I demand allegiance by you all. I am mad at all those guys. Not at all. He could care less about himself. We get all, well, you know, you did that. Paul didn't do that. Paul's sitting in a dungeon. He's sitting in a jail. He gets the reports from Epaphroditus and Epaphras and Tychicus and and Timothy and Titus and the guys of, hey, man, they're really hating on you out here. He goes, I don't care. Whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I, will there, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and well rejoice. Boy, what patience with people. <laughs> what ability to look at the situation and say, you know what, I could care... I'm not demand, he doesn't demand allegiance. He doesn't demand that he gets out and off the hook and how dare they. He rather sits there and says, you know what? Whether they're doing it for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, what's the issue? Christ is preached. That helps you understand when people disagree with you. Okay. <laughs> I've come to, after the years of ministry and being in it since literally born into it, if you will. But on my own, people are going to do what people want to do, and they're going to say what they want to say, and ain't nothing you can do about it. You can get mad, bow your little puny little back up, stick out your little puffy little chest like you're somebody special. They're still going to get mad at you. They're still going to walk all over you. But you know what? Paul teaches us something in here. Look at, look at what he says, verse 18, carefully. Whether in pretense or in truth. If they're out there preaching how bad I am, in order to preach how somebody's bad, you know what you have to tell people? 
what they preach. So if they're railing on Paul about his right division, real basic, then what are they having to show them? Well, back there in time past, and but now in the ages to come, you know, this is what they say, right? Hey, how about the issue of water baptism? The fact that you don't. We don't do that today. Where it's a spiritual bath. Well, don't you know that they say over there that it's a spirit baptism? We now we know better, but it's a spirit bath. So what are they preaching? They're preaching Paul's doctrine. So he says, whether they're doing it, now if they're doing it out of love and truth, then they're preaching. But if they're not and they're up there doing it against you, what are they doing? They're still preaching the doctrine, aren't they? <laughs> Paul says, they're preaching to people that I would never get to preach to because they don't like me. And you know what? They're preaching to those people. This, this is point two. They're preaching to those people the stuff I'd be preaching to them. But I can't because they don't like me. You see how he just turns that whole situation around and says, the advantage is Christ is preached, so I'm going to rejoice in that. That's fascinating. Just to sit there, he's not in Holiday Inn. He's sitting down in, in the prison cell. And he says, you know what? You know, Titus, the boys come down, Timothy brings him a, a note, sends him a note and says, hey, they're really, you know, boy, Twitter's blew up all over about you. He goes, I don't care. That's great, man. Christ be preached. Let's rejoice in that. Hey, how about another chorus of Amazing Grace? <laughs> Let's write our own one. This, you know, he's just he is his patient. He's being patient with the truth. He's staying with it regardless of what it looks like. So Paul practiced what he preached, and Timothy, you know it. Now come back there to 2 Timothy 3. We got five minutes. Because verse 11 is where the list really ends. We're going to pick up in verse 11, but I, I want you to see. Paul practiced what he preached. Timothy, you know it. The doctrine, my doctrine, you heard me preach and teach this stuff, and then you went and you saw me live it. Let's be like that. But then the first of verse 11, he says, Persecution and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra. Not only did he practice what he preached, but he wasn't concerned about the cost and the consequences, the persecution and afflictions. Now, we're going to look at all that next time. By the way, Antioch and Lystra and Iconium, that's where we started in Acts 13 and 14. Second Timothy is where he ends, and you know what he did? He ends where he began, because what's happened? It's come full circle. Is right. Nothing's changed. He was getting persecuted over there in the beginning, and he's getting nailed over here at the end. And there's a life cycle to that. He ends his ministry where he started. You see, folks, Paul was willing to take on the cost, no matter what it was. He says there to those Philippians, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. To so stay in the flesh is, you need that. But man, I'd die. I'd die right now. Because to die and go to glory is gain, man. Just boom, get me out of here. No matter what the cost was, it was worth paying in Paul's mind. Timothy. Don't be like Janice and Jambres. You have me as your pattern. And you know what? It's worth paying the cost to follow me. The last days, they're on Paul. People say, oh, they're coming later. No, they're here. They're perilous times, though. Dangerous times. Times of hurt. Life-threatening times. And he says, man, it's still worth it all. And it's worth, you know why? Because you fully know your pattern has completely, when he says there, I finished my course in the next chapter, 
It says there in Acts 2, I'm doing my course with joy. You have a course there of a life of Paul. And he says, you know it all. I can keep nothing back from you. And no matter what it is, boy, it's worth living. Because that's what life is really all about. Okay? Now we'll pick up in verse 11 and knock out some of that and go on down a little bit more. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for the Apostle Paul, for his doctrine, for his life, that we can go and look at it and study it and, and just pay attention to it and have it be a, a, a blessing and a motivation for us today. And we'll just give you the praise and the glory. Amen.